Is God real? Are the stories in the Bible true? I need answers. Welcome to A Closer Look with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh, and I'm very happy that you chose to spend the next hour with us as we delve into the study of God's Word. We can't do what we don't know. Here at Shiloh, we want to spend time studying the Word so that we can rightly apply the Word to our daily living and make a difference in our community and in our world for Jesus Christ. Won't you join us now for a closer look into God's Word? We have been uh, using the Bible study experience to elaborate on the Sunday sermons. We didn't preach Sunday, (laughs) so I'm not going to be able to do that today. I've been enjoying doing that. I I didn't know how well I would, but I've been enjoying that. So today, uh, because Pastor Hill preached and did a wonderful job uh, for us on, on this past Sunday, uh, it gives us the freedom to, to explore a different passage. So I invite your attention today to the book of Second John. <clears throat> Not John's Gospel account, Second John. It's a short book, and if God is willing, and I don't chase too many rabbits, we can cover the whole book in this one hour setting. I, I realize now as I get older, I am quite capable of chasing rabbits for 45, 50 minutes at a time. Uh, and, and sometimes that's beneficial, sometimes it is not. But there are some uh, interesting things that we can learn uh, in Second John if we spend some time delving into it. If, if you've been uh, with me any length of time, you know that I have a, a personal affinity for John and for all of John's writings. Uh, John uh, is responsible for, or his name is on, uh, five books of our New Testament. John's Gospel account, uh, the three epistles that bear his name, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Revelation. Uh, And I find John's writing Uh, to be uh, very illustrative and elaborative uh, on aspects of Christian ministry that you don't get from anyone else. His gospel accounts give us uh, uh, stories and uh, lessons that you don't find in what we commonly call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And his theme is always the same Uh, even in the Revelation. And that theme is love must be primary above all else. Uh, And and that love that he lifts up is agape. Uh, We've talked about the fact that uh, the word love, our English word love, comes from various words in the Greek, uh, but that the love that John lifts up as Christian love, as divine love, as Christ-like love, is called agape. And if we are to be disciples of Christ, uh, then we should be very careful uh, that we show agape in all that we do. And it's a reminder that uh, showing agape is not always the easiest thing in the world to do. It does not come naturally. It only happens supernaturally. Uh, We we are not born uh, as loving people. Uh, we're, we're born as selfish people, uh, and, and, and that's not an insult. It's just a statement of fact. Uh, if, if, if you've ever been around uh, small babies, infants, uh, babies are selfish creatures. What they want is what they want, and what they want is to satisfy themselves in some way or another. They either want to have attention, uh, they want to be fed, or they want to be changed, and they don't like pain. They cry if they're in pain. They cry if they're hungry. They cry if they can't have their way. They don't care about anybody else. It's, it, it was, it, it's always amusing to me in church when, when a baby starts acting up and I hear folk go, shh, shh. Like, the baby don't care that you're saying shush. The baby wants you to give the baby what the baby wants. 
You give the baby what the baby wants, guess what? You ain't got to go shh no more because, because the baby will be satisfied. It is simply a way of life. We grow up and we are taught that we are supposed to be courteous and gracious people. Most of us are taught that, that, that we are to be courteous and gracious people. And yet, even when we are taught that, there are limits to how courteous and how gracious we are going to be uh, because we are always concerned about uh, being taken advantage of. We're always concerned about people uh, using us for their own uh, selfish desires and, and us coming out on the short end of that stick. It's supposed to be a mutual thing where we give to others as others give uh, to us. But if you've lived more than a moment, you know that it doesn't always work out that way. And so as we grow, we become defensive. And in some cases, uh, we become angry. And, 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 and that anger and that defense mechanism kicks in and we stop being loving. We stop being gracious. Uh, except in those cases where we think that it serves us some good. Uh, if I ain't talking to you, don't get mad. But if I am talking to you, you need to do something about that. Uh, uh, but, but life hardens us in such a way that after you've lived for a while, uh, we, we come to understand that being loving is a risky venture. Uh, showing love toward others is it, 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 it exposes us, it makes us vulnerable, and many of us are not comfortable with that level of vulnerability. So when we read things in the gospel that Jesus teaches, such as love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that use you and persecute you, turn the other cheek, walk the second mile, give up your coat if they sue you for your coat. We read them, we say amen because Jesus said it, but then we go on and live our lives by our own code of right and wrong. But John teaches us over and over and over again that the love that God has shown toward us is the love that we should show toward one another. In John's gospel account, he, he writes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then he tells us several times in, in John chapters 13 through 16, as I have loved you, so should you love one another. John places a priority on love. And it only happens when we step outside ourselves and yield to the direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's not something you can do on your own. It's not something you can accomplish on your own. It's, it's interesting, uh, our Sunday school lesson uh, this coming week comes from the book of Galatians. And Paul is writing uh, to that church and he's talking about uh, the importance of love uh, as being our uh, purpose in life. I, I, I was saying to the Sunday school teachers just last night, it's important that we understand the distinction between goal and purpose. Most of us want to have goals for our lives, but we fail to recognize the significance of purpose. Purpose is more important than goals. Yeah. You, all of us can have certain goals, and, and, and if we're all in the same uh, uh, area of expertise, let's say that we were all uh, football players, j j just to use that as an example. And, and if I were to ask you as a football player, as a professional football player, what is your goal? Most of you would write some of the same things. Want to win a championship, want to win a Super Bowl, want uh, to set this record, want to do that. Those are your goals. But when I ask you what is your purpose, you don't know how to respond to that. 
Here's the thing. In order to achieve the goal, you got to know what your purpose is. Maximize the talents that you have been blessed to have. Work hard. Be diligent. Be consistent. Learn how to develop the skills that you have been given and hone them in such a way so that, not so that you can win a championship, but so that you can maximize your potential. And if you maximize your potential, the great likelihood is you'll end up winning a championship. But if you have a goal without purpose, then you just got a dream. And a whole lot of folk have dreams. But if you have a purpose, the purpose can help you achieve your goals. Translate that into the church. What, what, what is the goal of the church? If, if, if you say it's to have more members, you would be wrong. That, although that's what many of us set as our goal. We, we, we are very quantitative people. Uh, we, 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 we say we want to have more members than thus and so. We, ha we want to have more members at the end of the year than we had at the start of the year. If, if that's your goal, every church in town has that. Some of them will achieve them. Some of them won't. Most of them will not. Let me ask you a different question. What's your purpose? Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's your purpose. And if you achieve your purpose, then achieving your purpose will make your goals possible. You're not responsible. And I, I know we like to think that we are. You're not responsible for who joins your church and who doesn't. You're not responsible for who accepts Christ and who does not. Within your family, within your social circle, within your, 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 your vocational circle, you're not responsible for who accepts Christ and who isn't. You know what you're responsible for? Letting Christ be revealed in your behavior, achieving that purpose. If you make that the, the, the purpose of your life, to reveal Christ in your character, in your conversation, in, in, in how you handle the day-to-day -day affairs of your life, it's going to touch somebody. It's going to affect somebody. They may come to accept Christ as your Savior. They may not. But you have done what you are supposed to do. When Jesus tells the parable of, of, uh, of the seed and the, uh, and, and, and the sower, uh, he, he talks about four different types of ground that uh, seed can fall on. Uh, and, and three out of the four are not good. Stony ground, uh, uh, thorny ground, shallow ground. In, in, in three of the four cases, no fruit comes from the planting of the seed. But if the seed falls on good ground, then the promise is that it will produce Great fruit, a hundredfold, tenfold, a thousandfold. It, 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 it produces wonderful fruit. But the thing is, you ain't responsible for how much fruit is produced. What you're responsible for is making sure that the seed is scattered. And if you do your job, leave the rest of it in God's hands. We, we, we're not making as many disciples as we once did. Are we letting Christ shine? Are we showing ourselves to be loving? Are we doing the things that Christ has called us to do? We got to have a meeting because we, we, we ain't had no baptisms uh, in, in this quarter. So, so we, we got to sit down and, and strategize. No, you ain't got to strategize. You got to let Jesus shine. Let, 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 let Christ shine. And, 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 and everywhere you go, don't just do it in here. Do it everywhere you go. Let that be the, the, the consistent thing about you, that people see Christ in you, hear Christ in you, that, that, that you reflect Christ in your everyday behavior. And it will produce in God's time because that's God's business. 
Our job is simply to do what we've been called to do. What does any of that have to do with Second John? Or, or John at all? It has to do with what John prioritizes. And what John prioritizes is that we learn how to love one another as God has loved us. That's our purpose. And when we do that, certain things come from that love. Let's read 2 John, and then we're going to talk about it. It's not, it's not long to read, it's just 13 verses. My dear congregation, I, your pastor, love you in very truth. I'm not alone. Everyone who knows the truth that has taken up permanent residence in us loves you. Let grace, mercy, and peace be with us in truth and love from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, Son of the Father. I can't tell you how happy I am to learn that many members of your congregation are diligent in living out the truth exactly as commanded by the Father. But permit me a reminder, friends, and this is not a new commandment, but simply a repetition of our original and basic charter that we love each other. Love means following his commandments, and his unifying commandment is that you conduct your lives in love. This is the first thing you heard, and nothing has changed. Do you think he has a theme in mind? His purpose is to remind us of our need to love. All right. But then he says something else in verse 7. There are a lot of smooth-talking charlatans loose in the world who refuse to believe that Jesus Christ was truly human, a flesh-and-blood human being. Give them their true title, deceiver, antichrist, and be very careful around them so you don't lose out on what we've worked so diligently in together. I want you to get every reward you have coming to you. Anyone who gets so progressive in his thinking that he walks out on the teaching of Christ walks out on God. But whoever stays with the teaching stays faithful to both the Father and the Son. If anyone shows up who doesn't hold to this teaching, don't invite him in and give him the run of the place. That would just give him a platform to perpetuate his evil ways, making you his partner. I have a lot more things to tell you, but I'd rather not use paper and ink. I hope to be there soon in person and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. That will be far more satisfying to both you and me. Everyone here in your sister congregation sends greetings. All right. You can look at 2 John and you can break it down into two large chunks. The first chunk is verses 1 through 6. The second chunk is verses 7 through 13. In verses 1 through 6, John reiterates just what I have been talking about, that love must be a priority in the work that we do for the master. Love is our purpose. And if we achieve our purpose, God will do the growing in his own time and in his own way. Love and truth. Do you, do you see the connection that he has here between love and truth? Understand, whenever John uses the word truth, it's a reference to Jesus. So when you read truth in any of John's writings, John's gospel, the epistles, or the revelation. When you read truth in your mind, you ought to see Jesus. How do I know that? John 14, verse 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus responds, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In John's Gospel account, whenever the word truth is used, it is used as a reference 
to Christ. Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is God in the flesh. And because Jesus is God in the flesh, there is no truth outside of Christ. And what he says here is that if you have the truth, the truth will teach you how to love. We started by saying love in the way that God wants us to love and the way that God loves us is not a human thing. It, it is not a natural thing. It is a supernatural thing. And the only way that we can do that is if we are indwelled and submitted to the Holy Spirit. And then the truth teaches us how to love. He says that with that love, certain things come along. He lists three things, grace, mercy, and peace. Let grace, mercy, and peace be with us in truth and love from God. What is grace? God's unmerited favor. What is mercy? Mercy is God giving us another chance when we've used up the previous chance that he gave us. How many of us, since we woke up this morning, have done something we said we weren't going to do? Thought something we said we weren't going to think? Said something we said we weren't going to say? Okay, if you made it to noon and you haven't done that yet, let's see how you do by sundown. <laughs> just, just send me a text and let me know how you did by sundown. We fall short. Grace is God giving us favor that we don't deserve. And mercy is God giving us another chance after we have failed with the previous opportunity. Peace is a contentment that rests upon us, that is transcendent of the circumstances that we may face. Peace is akin to joy. And we've, we, we, we've said several times that there is a distinction between joy and happiness. Happiness has to do with circumstances. We are happy when circumstances are in our favor. And that happiness goes away as the circumstances change. But joy stays with us because joy is not rooted in circumstances. Joy is rooted in our relationship with God. In a similar fashion, we can have peace in the midst of chaotic times, not because we don't recognize the chaos, but because we don't seek our anchor to be placed in the chaotic times. Our anchor is in our relationship with Christ. And Christ gives us peace in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the chaos. And so John tells us that grace, mercy, and peace, unmerited favor, another chance, and transcendent contentment are with us because of the truth, Jesus, and love, agape, that come from God through Jesus Christ. It tells us what our state of being is to be. It tells us how our day-by-day -day living ought to be. And it's possible it's not an impossibility. It's possible for us to have that on a regular and consistent basis if we constantly remember whose we are and whose we are not. I, don't, I, I, I would never dare to presume that anybody in here believes that they uh, should avail themselves <clears throat> to Satan or demonic influences. You might want to send other folk to hell, but, 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 but you know, you, I, I know you say that about some folk. 
but, 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 but nobody in here wants to avail themselves to satanic or demonic influences. I, I, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable in, in saying that. But it's not about availing yourselves to Satan or, de, or demons. It's about availing yourself to you. It's about you wanting to be in charge. Your biggest competition with being godly ain't Satan, it's you. It's you wanting to be in, in charge of your own life. It's you wanting to take the reins of your own life. It's you wanting to act on the impulses that are, are, are pressing against you, whispering in your ear. I remind you, Satan can't do nothing. All Satan can do is whisper. And then it's up to you to either tell Satan to hush or you to succumb to what Satan whispers in your ear. Resist the devil, James says, and he will flee. Our problem is, quite often, Satan just whispers to us that which we already wanted to do in the first place. And, 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 and somehow or other, we feel like Satan's whisper gives us license to do what we wanted to do. Your biggest uh, 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 threat to a contented life is the daily, hourly decision that you have to make to yield yourself to God in each and every situation. I remind you, in Scripture, Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I am? And Peter, under the auspices of the Holy Spirit, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. A few seconds later, Jesus starts talking about the things that are going to happen to him. And the same Peter says, no, Lord, that ain't going to happen to you. you. You need to hush up with all of that. And Jesus turns and says, get behind me, Satan. Your problem is that Sometimes you speak, and it's not Christ speaking in you. It's you speaking in you. Sometimes you act, and it's not God acting in you. It's you acting in you. And it can happen, and you don't even know how it happened. I didn't even think that I was capable of doing that. Yeah, well, you're human. And if you're human, you're capable of doing all kinds of things. One of the, 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 the important things about our Christian walk is truly being transparent with God. I don't think that you have to be transparent with people as much as you have to be transparent with God. It's important to, 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 to be transparent with people, but, but let, let, let's be honest. There's some people that it's, it's dangerous to be transparent with. You, you share too much with some people and they'll find a way to use it against you. But you should be 100% transparent with God. Tell him everything, share everything, and allow God to talk to you. And when that happens, when you give yourself completely to God and allow God to talk to you and, 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 and you really hear what God is saying, transformation takes place in your life. Because less and less is it about you and more and more is it about God. Paul says something, you know, I, I, I know y'all like Paul, so I, I, I invoke Paul a lot uh, uh, because I, I know that you're comfortable with what Paul has to say. Paul says some things that, that can be helpful to us. For example, Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. I've had all kinds of experiences. 
I've had hands full. I've had hands empty. I've had belly full. I've had belly empty. But I have learned whether I have or I don't have, I can be content in Christ. Now, the key word for y'all is content, but the key word for me is learned. Because learned implies experience. Learned implies trial and error. You don't learn automatically. You, 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 you have to go through an experience to learn. And more learning is done through failure and repeating than there is in just getting it right. When Paul says, I've learned to be content, he's letting us know that there were times when I wasn't content. When he says, I've learned, he's, he's letting us know that there were times when contentment was far from me, when, when, when I had questions for God, when I had challenges for God. And that's a good thing for us to know. It's a good thing for us to see in the text because it lets us know we ain't crazy. If Paul had to learn, what does that say about us? If Peter had to learn, what does that say about us? If John had to learn, I remind you, John uh, uh, was, was, was with his brother James, and they yanked Jesus off to the side one day, and they said, look, when you come into your kingdom, we want you to, to treat us different from everybody else. We want one of us to be on your right hand and the other one on your left. John had to learn. John found himself not on the right hand of the throne. John found himself on an island called Patmos all by himself. And he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day all by myself. And God revealed certain things to me. Contentment is not something that comes automatically. It's something that we have to learn. And what we have to learn more than anything else is how to overcome our own human uh, temptation for selfishness and yield ourselves completely to the Holy Spirit. John says that it's important that we learn these things. But then the second half of the, the, the short letter gives us a warning. And I find the warning very, very interesting because it's wrapped around false preachers and false teachers. There are a lot of smooth-talking charlatans loose in the world who refuse to believe that Jesus Christ was truly human a flesh and blood human being, give them their true title, deceiver, antichrist. Okay, where did that come from? We're talking about truth and love, and we're talking about grace and peace and mercy. So where did this come from? How did you go from grace and peace and mercy talking about be careful about fake preachers, fake teachers. John is giving an important caution to this particular congregation. Much of the Bible is written to deal with specific situations. Now, here's what we do in the church that's not always wise. I'm not saying that it's always wrong, but sometimes it's not wise. And that is we read the text without trying to take into consideration the context in which a text is given. Context is important. Take scripture completely out of it. 
Have you ever been misunderstood for something that you said that was taken out of context? I'm looking at people who are in their 50s, 60s, some of y'all 70 years old. So I know y'all done lived for a minute. And if you've lived for a minute, it's happened. Somebody reported part of what you said, but didn't report all of what you said. Somebody reported what you said with a certain kind of tone attached to it. That wasn't the tone that you had when you said what you said, but it got back to the person with that kind of tone attached to it, and you were misunderstood as saying one thing when in fact you were saying something else. Context is important. It's not just about the words, it's the words that are given within a particular context. And, 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 and what John is warning against here is a specific situation to this church, this congregation. He calls himself at the start, look at verse 1, he calls himself your pastor, which means he's speaking to this particular congregation. And so, as we read this, it is important that we seek to draw from it points that are relevant to us. And I say, are there congruent points that can be drawn from the specific situation that the text speaks to and situations that we are facing in our own present day lives? If the answer is yes, apply it. If not, be careful how you apply certain scriptures. There are people, for example, who use scripture to suggest that women could not, should not ever preach in the church. And they quote Paul, who says, I do not permit women to preach. But they quote Paul outside of context. Paul was speaking to a specific situation where certain women were taking over the worship experience and interrupting the worship in such a way that no teaching could go forth. And he's very specific about what he says. He says, I do not. He does not say, the Lord told me that women can't preach. He said, I don't. In this situation, I don't do that. And people, well, Paul says that women can't preach because he, he said this in this particular text. Okay, Paul also says that women should keep their heads covered. So all y'all, I'm looking at a bunch of women, ain't got nothing on your head. Same Paul. Shouldn't cut your hair. I'm looking at folk. Right? Okay, I'm just checking. How is it that we pull out one thing that fits our own contextual point of view and we don't pull out everything else? If it's general for one thing, then it's general for everything. Y'all got on lipstick? Y'all got on rouge? Blush? I can keep going. Y'all got on some silver, some gold? Y'all got some necklaces, some earrings? All of those adornments, according to Paul, shouldn't have it. And by the way, if we really believed that women should not teach or speak in the church, there'd be no choir, there'd be no Sunday school, there'd be no vacation Bible school, there'd be nothing. 80 to 85 percent of the church is female. So when y'all say amen, I'm supposed to stop y'all. Don't say that. You ain't supposed to speak in the church. Do you see how ridiculous that is? It's what happens when we take things out of context. How does John get to this place 
where, where, where he goes from talking about love to talking about fake preachers in the world. He is warning the church that he pastors to be on guard against people who will use your Christian love as a means by which to give them an opportunity to teach false doctrine within your church, within your worship setting. Read the whole thing. There are a lot of smooth-talking charlatans loose in the world who refuse to believe that Jesus Christ was truly human. That's false doctrine. A flesh and blood human being. Give them their true title, deceiver, antichrist, and be very careful around them so you don't lose out on what you've worked so diligently in together. I want you to get every reward you have coming to you. Anyone who gets so progressive in his thinking that he walks out on the teaching of Christ walks out on God. People will use your love if you allow them to as a means by which to plant their seeds of discord, their seeds of false teaching, their seeds of carnality in the church for their own selfish ends. John is speaking primarily of people that we call Gnostics. There were three great heresies in the first century church. One was legalism. If you go to Sunday school Sunday, that's what they're going to be talking about, legalists, Judaizers. Uh, that, that, that's, that's what the lesson is about. You should go to Sunday school. I, 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 just let me say that as I move on. You should go to Sunday school. Okay? If you want to wear your mask, go to Sunday school with your mask on. But go to Sunday school. You, 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 if you want to sit away from folk, sit away from folk, but go to Sunday school. Sunday school been open now for more than a year. It's time for y'all to go back to Sunday school. Just like it's time, just like it's time for y'all to stop watching me on TV and come down here and start watching me in the sanctuary. Just saying. Uh, 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 we, we, we have to recognize that uh, there are those who will use your love in order to plant seeds of dissension within the church because they have their own end, and their own end is about them. Anybody who makes the church about them doesn't have the love of Christ at the forefront of their hearts. I'm not, going, I'm not going to say that they don't have the love of Christ. I'm just going to say the love of Christ is not in control of their behavior. And this is true for pastors, and this is true for deacons, and this is true for deaconesses, and this is true for choir members, and this is true for Sunday school teachers, and this is true for anybody else in the church. If Jesus is not at the center of what you are about, then his love is not prevailing in your heart. If you sing in the choir, but you can't sing any time that you ain't the one leading, you got a problem. If the only time you can sing is when you lead, if the only time you can come to Sunday school is when you teach it. You know, we, we team teach here at Shiloh. But if you only come on the Sundays that you teach, and you ain't here no other day, and you can't support your team partner and teach you got a problem because now it's all about you we have to recognize that that kind of attitude exists in the world and they will use your Christian love as a means of trying to break into the fellowship and diminish the work that we are doing for Christ and John says it is not loving to allow this kind of sinful behavior to prevail within your congregation. It's like a disease. 
that spreads throughout the body. We just came through a pandemic for two plus years. We, we, we had to set ourselves apart from people. Some of you, I did. So, some of you contracted COVID. I, when, when I discovered that me and Demetria had COVID, we had to stay apart from everybody. I, I had to stay away from everybody. It was not a loving thing to say, look, I got COVID, but y'all come on by the house. <sighs> I got COVID, but we fixing dinner tonight. Y'all come on in and we gonna eat. No, the loving thing to do was to stay away for fear that what we had would infect somebody else. Well, let me ask you this. If you are, as many of you are, the head of your house, and you have people in your house, spouse, children, perhaps grandchildren in your house, and somebody shows up at your door with a contagious disease, saying, look, I need a place to stay. Are you going to invite them with their contagious self into your house and exposure? Well, now the Christian thing to do would, would, would be to provide them shelter. I got Holiday Inn, I got uh, 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 Marriott, I got all kinds of places, and I will give you money to go those places. I tell you what, well, you ain't coming. You ain't coming into my house. Because I have a responsibility to protect the people who are in my house. I have a responsibility to make sure that they are safe from all perceivable hurt, harm, and danger. And it is not loving to expose them to sickness just so that I can make one person happy. There are other means by which to do that. In the same way, I'm not going to have, my responsibility as pastor of this church is for every word that goes forth from that pulpit. I'm responsible for that. So I'm responsible for every preacher that comes through here. I'm responsible for all the teaching that takes place. And I don't say that arrogantly, I say that as a matter of fact. It is my responsibility. And so when I find false teaching taking place in this church, my duty to protect the members of Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church is to shut it down. to cut it out, to exclude it, so that the body is not infected with false doctrine. John says, when you have these folk coming around, these that he describes as smooth-talking charlatans, when they come around, shut them down. I say it, everything is about context. It was the common practice of this day, of this time, much as it is today, but, but, but in this time, it was more personal. It was the common practice in this time that if people came as preachers or teachers of the message of Christ, they were to be received by the community. We, we were to show hospitality. And hospitality meant that we brought them into our homes, we allowed them the opportunity to speak. When Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus wasn't out, Jesus hadn't lived in, in, in Nazareth for a long time. It, it was his home, but, it, it, but he had not lived there. He shows up in Nazareth, he goes to the synagogue, and as part of their hospitality, they said, would you like to read from the scripture today? And oh, why did they do that? Because they weren't prepared for what Jesus had to say. 
He started reading from Isaiah, and then he started expounding on what he read from Isaiah. And keep reading the text. We read the part where he quotes Isaiah. Read it on to the end. They pushed Jesus to the edge of a cliff, and they were ready to push him over because they weren't prepared for what Jesus had to say. Now, here's the distinction. What Jesus was saying was true, but what a lot of these folk that John is talking about were spouting were lies. And the lies had the potential of infecting the body. You and I both know that a lie travels a whole lot faster and farther than the truth. All you got to do is say, let me, let me share with you the scoop. Let me share with you the tea. Let, let, let me give you the 411, however y'all say it. Y'all know how to say it. And that'll travel, that'll spread like wildfire. And John is saying you shouldn't give it an opportunity. It's not loving to give it an opportunity. It, 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 is, it is a failure to live up to your loving responsibility to those that are under your care. And so he's warning the people not to allow that to happen. He says something else that's important, and that is he warns about those who walk out on the good news of Christ. Read, 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 read the text. He says, anyone who gets so progressive in his thinking that he walks out on the teaching of Christ, walks out on God. Did y'all think splits just started happening a few years ago in churches? Splits been going on for a long time. Somebody comes in with something that, that, that they think is new and, and they say it with enthusiasm and, and heaven help if they can actually quote a scripture or two and, and, and plug it in there and before you know it you got a little crowd and, and, and if you're not careful that little crowd can, can grow into a splinter a split from within the body of Christ now Churches split all the time. It's, it should not happen, but it does. Uh, 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 I'm, I, I'm grateful. One of the things that my father loved to say about this church is however number of years it is, we're coming up on our 151st anniversary. However, however many years you are, so many years, no splits. So many years, four pastors, no splits. He, he always had to throw in that no splits part at the end. And I'm grateful for the fact that Shiloh has suffered no split. It does not mean that they ain't been folk who done left Shiloh because they were teaching something and wanted to espouse something and wanted to, to promote something that was contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. They come and they go. And from time to time, I guess I shouldn't say this, but I'm, I'm close to the end. From time to time, somebody will come to me and say to me, you know, so-and-so thinking about leaving the church. And, and you know what my response is? Let them go. That's not mean, and it's not arrogant. And I, I, I want the record to show, because I've said it, so I want the record to show, yeah, I've said it, and this is why I said it. I didn't, I didn't invite them to come. They came on their own, exercising their own free will. And if they decide to leave, they left on their own, exercising their own free will. I said to y'all a few minutes ago, I ain't responsible for the fruit. I'm responsible for planting the seed. And some seed doesn't fall on good ground. Doesn't mean that the seed is defective. Just means there was something wrong 
with the ground. And so if, 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 if the ground decides that they don't want this seed, guess what? Ground can go and try to find some other seed somewhere else. There are 400 plus black Baptist churches in the greater Baton Rouge area. You ought to find one where you can be happy. Church should not be a place where you come in miserable all the time. You want to know when you got a problem in the church? When everybody comes in like this. And they sit like this. And they frown like this. If, if, if that's what you do when you come to church, let me suggest you're in the wrong church. You, you, you're in the wrong way. Church ought to be a place where you are happily engaged in the praise and worship of God. But that does not mean that we are going to forfeit the gospel just to make you happy. The gospel says that we should love everybody. Regardless of their station in life, regardless of their past or their present, we should love everybody with the love that Christ has shown toward us. God has never qualified his love for us. God has never said, I'll love you only as long as you do this. I'll love you only as long as you act like that. God loves us anyway. Unqualified love. And I'm glad because there are too many times in my own personal life when I didn't measure up to the love that God has extended toward me. See, when I say he looked beyond my thoughts and met my need, that ain't just quoting a hymn. That's my life. He picked me up and planted my feet on a solid foundation. And with all that he has done, I still mess up from time to time. But I love the fact that he loves me anyhow. And if he can love me anyhow, it is my responsibility to learn how to love you anyhow. Whoever you are, I ain't necessarily talking about y'all sitting here, whoever you are, whatever you do, however you think, Whatever political party you are a part of, whatever school you support, whatever race you are, it is my Christian responsibility to learn how to love you anyway. And, 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 and loving you is what I'm trying to do. But loving you does not mean that I'm going to expose those that I'm responsible for protecting to foolishness. There have been times, I gotta stop, there have been times when the choir has sung a song and I have gone to the music staff and said, I don't wanna hear that song no more. Not because they didn't sing it well, but because the doctrine is wrong. Spirit of the living God, because y'all going to think, well, what song is he talking about? Let, 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 let me give you one. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Wonderful sentiment, theologically wrong. Where's, it, wh where's the spirit going to fall from? Have you read your Bible? Acts chapter 2, the spirit was poured out on all believers, never to be taken away from us. So where's the Spirit going to fall from? And why does the Spirit have to fall fresh? What'd you do with the Spirit that you had? Instead of worrying yourself about new falling of the Spirit, 
Worry yourself about getting out of the way so that the spirit can have control of your life. I don't want to hear spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. That's just one example. I got others. There are certain preachers, you ought to invite so No, so-and-so ain't coming here. Not if I got anything to do with it. Now, one, one day, I might not have anything to do with it. But, but while I got something to do with it, prosperity, religion, slinging oil all over the place, health and wealth, touch your neighbor, give, give folk high fives, that ain't coming here. God wants you to be rich. That ain't coming here. I have a responsibility. And I'm going to live up to that responsibility to the best of my ability as I'm guided by the Lord. Now, I'm talking about my role as pastor of this church, but as I've said to you many times, and I really got to stop, you're your own pastor. You got, you got a congregation. You might not get paid, you might not put pastor down as your title, but you got a congregation. You got folk who listen to you. You got folk who listen to you that don't listen to me. And I know that. Been doing this for a long time. And, and I know that there are folk who will listen to you who will not listen to me. Be a good pastor and protect the folk that are in your congregation. And teach them to follow the dictates of Christ and to show love by protecting those that are in your circle. And don't let every whim of foolishness carry you away. Lord God, thank you for this time of sharing. We pray that what has been said and done has been pleasing in your sight, edifying to your people, and uplifting to your holy and righteous name. Keep us in your protective care as we go. In the name of Jesus, who is our Christ, we pray. Amen. Y'all have a good afternoon. Keep coming back. Tell somebody else to come with you. Very same people are the quickest to try racism at the slightest provocation or for no reason at all. There's no systemic racism. There is no law. There is nothing that says that I can't do something as a black person that you can do. We're honoring all of the great white men who are being smeared and defamed and torn down. I'm not sure how many people paid attention to the recent report in the Advocate newspaper, but COVID infections are on the rise once again in our state. Advocate reporter Rebecca Holland stated that Louisiana health experts confirm that COVID-19 has morphed into a form that spreads more easily, but is less severe. That means the virus, which once all but shut down the state and killed more than 19,000 people, could eventually become like the flu, relatively common, but also easy to treat as long as people stay vaccinated. Holland reports that between July 10th and 16th, 1,898 new cases were reported to the state. The Department of Health said the week before, cases were at 1,192, and a month prior to that, at 784. Health officials believe the actual number of infections is much higher because home testing has become widely available and the results of those tests are not reported to the state. Oxner Health System has seen a spike in daily reports from between 15 to 20 patients per day over the past six months to between 35 and 40 inpatient admissions over the past six weeks. Said Dr. Aldo Russo, Regional Medical Director for Oxner Baton Rouge, over the past month and a half, what we've seen is a significant increase, not pandemic levels, but still double the number. But the good news is that people are not dying from this. The severity of the infection is not what we saw in the past. Despite the increase, infection rates are nowhere near where they have been before. Dr. Jeff Elder, Medical Director for Emergency Management for the Louisiana Children's Medical Center stated that as of July 21st, the LCMC Health System in New Orleans had about 15 patients who were COVID-19 positive. If you compare that to last year in the summertime, we were around 75 or so. We're in a much better place now than we were back then. 
We're delighted that deaths are down and hospitalizations are relatively low. Since May 3rd, the virus has put fewer than 100 in hospitals each day, down from a high of 3,022 hospitalizations in August of 2021. The Louisiana Department of Health had this to say in a statement regarding our current status. While COVID is still with us, the crisis is behind us. Louisiana has enjoyed a sustained period of low COVID hospitalizations, although there are some preliminary state and national indications that transmission rates of COVID may be beginning to increase again. Staying up to date on your vaccines, including getting the bivalent booster, is the best way to stay safe and to enjoy the summer with confidence. Currently, the people doctors are seeing most are those with other conditions exacerbated by COVID. Said Dr. Russo, people are requiring some ventilation support, oxygen supplementation, some help to manage their other comorbidities or other conditions they have. When somebody who has emphysema or heart disease gets COVID, it affects every organ and they become weaker. Those who are hospitalized with COVID are typically given remdesivir or Paxlovid, both antiviral medications. Remdesivir is administered intravenously, while Paxlovid is an oral medication given as an outpatient treatment. Monoclonal antibody therapy once a popular COVID treatment is no longer used because of adverse side effects and lack of efficacy. The biggest reasons COVID-19 deaths are down are because of immunity and because of the virus itself. According to the National Institute of Health, as of November 2022, 94% of the U.S. population was estimated to have been infected by COVID at least once. Combined with vaccination, 97% were estimated to have some immunological exposure. Moreover, the virus has morphed into a different kind of beast. Said Dr. Russo, nature is very smart because what has happened is that the virus has sacrificed severity for spreading. The virus is trying to survive like any species. And what it's doing is sacrificing how much illness it can cause for the ability of being more present in the community. Eventually, COVID will become as common as the flu, and that's why vaccination is crucial. During the 2019-2020 influenza season, the Centers for Disease Control estimated that 38 million people nationally became sick with the flu. 18 million visited a health care provider for flu symptoms. 400,000 people were hospitalized, and 22,000 people died because of the flu. The flu vaccine has reduced the risk of flu illness in vaccinated people by 40 to 60 percent. Using that as a model going forward, Dr. Russo said, eventually what I think is going to happen is that COVID is going to become just like the flu and people will be offered yearly boosters, mostly because we know the vaccine is extremely safe. Cases of adverse reactions with the vaccine are very, very small. At this point, the CDC recommends that everyone should get a bivalent booster, which became available last year. If you've done that already, you should have had four shots total, the initial two shots and two boosters. Dr. Elder said he thinks the CDC will recommend another booster sometime this fall. Pay attention to the news. If a bivalent booster comes out and is recommended by the CDC, please get that. And if you haven't been vaccinated, please get vaccinated. Adds Russo, we're still vaccinating people for free. We're still testing people across the state. We're making sure that people have those resources available for them to prevent further complications. We must stay vigilant. COVID is still changing and is still capable of causing new waves of disease and death. COVID long haul is a very real medical dilemma, causing brain fog, physical and mental fatigue, persistent respiratory and cardiac problems. In Louisiana, 63% of our citizens have received one dose of vaccine. Only 55% are fully vaccinated. Less than 1% have received a booster. Essentially, these are the same numbers that we reported in May, the time of our last update. As a state, we rank 47th out of 50. The national percentage of the fully vaccinated is 69%. That being said, while Shiloh urges members and visitors to continue to wear a mask, 
If you suffer from other medical problems such as diabetes, respiratory illness, or heart problems especially, there is no longer a mask mandate for our worship and Christian education activities. We will continue to exercise caution by limiting touch and sanitizing our facility between worship experiences, by continuing with the modified order of worship, and we have free masks available to those who wish to receive them. We thank the Shiloh family for its continued cooperation, and we solicit your prayers. Lord God, once again, we approach you in this moment regarding the COVID virus. We thank you, dear God, that the news across the nation and within our state is brighter than it has been in the past. We thank you that the loss of life has been mitigated, but we recognize, dear God, that there are still dangers regarding this virus, and we ask that you would help us to maintain a proper and appropriate vigilance that we might go forward as strong as we possibly can be by relying upon the knowledge that is available to us. Be with doctors and nurses and researchers and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected and who put themselves at risk in the process. May they, may they know your protection and your peace. Be with our leaders, particularly our local leaders. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people that they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to choose long-term solutions that will help prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. Whether we are at home or abroad, surrounded by many people suffering from this illness or only a few, we ask, dear God, that you would stay with us as we endure, as we mourn, as we persist, as we prepare. Keep us, dear God, in your peace at all times. In the name of Jesus, who is our Christ, we pray. Amen.